Okay, and um, we are live. So welcome everyone to uh, week two of Stackademic. Uh, it's amazing that you have stayed with us for now um, and hopefully you're going to find out some interesting things today. Um, the As you know, this lesson is going to be about HTML. Uh, now, HTML is one of those kind of topics that feels really simple, and to some extent it is, but there's still a lot to learn. And we're going to try or uh, to teach you as much as possible in this one lesson. So today's lesson is going to be half theory and half practical. Uh, and by that, what I mean is I'll be presenting for the first half uh, and then demonstrating some code in the second half. Now, although I'll be coding, um, you won't be expected to do so right now. Um, instead, what would be better is if you focus on the concepts um, that we'll be discussing. Uh, and your homework at the end of the class will be to implement some of those concepts. Um, and on the, like I said, I, although I'm sure that many of you have used HTML before, I will be very surprised if a single one of you goes away from this lecture without at least having learned one new thing. Okay, so let's begin um, by first loading up the presentation again or sharing that screen. Um, okay. Right. Okay, so HTML part one. <laughs> so um, as I said, it's going to be broken up into two parts. So the first part is what you can see on the screen. So we're going to introduce HTML, talk a little bit about markup and syntax, um, talk about what goes inside an element, uh, introduce some empty elements, talk about something known as block versus inline, or rather block elements and inline elements. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the attributes that can uh, go on HTML tags. So HTML or hypertext markup language is the most basic building block of the web. Uh, it defines the meaning and structure of web content. Um, and other technologies besides HTML are generally used to describe a web page's appearance or presentation, uh, in that case, CSS, or its functionality and behavior, in that case, uh, JavaScript. Uh, now, as a wise person once said, um, if a website was a person, HTML would be the skeleton. Um, and, and we're not entirely sure who said this, um, but we reckon it might have been this person on the screen. Um, and as an aside, if HTML was the, was the skeleton of a person, I'd like to have a little think about what parts CSS and JavaScript would be uh, in regards to you know the, the person. So hypertext in hypertext markup language refers to links that connect web pages to one another, either within a single website or between websites. Uh, and links are a fundamental aspect of the web. So you know, by uploading content to the internet and, and linking to pages created by other people, you become an active participant in the World Wide Web. Markup uh, is what we use to annotate text, images, uh, and other content for display in a web browser. And of course, language just means language. Um, OK, so here are a bunch of examples of some HTML elements. Now, there's maybe you've heard of some of them before. Uh, and maybe some make sense. Um, maybe others don't. Um, so uh, just before I continue as well, I, I just want to make sure, can everybody can everybody hear and see OK? I can see Chantel mentioned something about sharing the screen. Um, can you all see the screen that I'm sharing? OK, that's good. So it sounds like everyone is OK. So Chantel, maybe try and leave and re-enter, and hopefully it will be OK. Um, right, I'll continue. So. Uh, an HTML element is segmented away from uh, other text in a document with tags, uh, which consist of an element name surrounded by opening and closing uh, angled brackets. So as you can see on the screen, we've um, put element 
uh, and then you would have content inside of it. Uh, element in this case, of course, would be replaced with you know whatever tag you're using. Uh, now, there are some elements that are self-closing. Typically, this would be signified by a backslash used at the end. As you can see, we have element followed by uh, oh, a forward slash, I should say, uh, and then the closing angled bracket. Uh, so in some cases, you can actually not, uh, you can omit or leave out that forward slash, but that's a bad practice. You, sh you should typically try to just to do it. Um, if you leave them out, the browsers in those cases will try to interpret it um, uh, and kind of assume that it should be a self-closing tag. But, you know, uh, try to follow best practices where you can. Uh, okay, now, HTML element tags are actually case insensitive. Uh, and that means that, uh, you know, you can write it in uppercase, lowercase, a mixture. Um, however, all of these would work in the, in the same way. Um, however, there are best practices and we should endeavor to follow them. So always use lowercase. As you progress with uh, web development, you will find instances where that second one with a capital uh, first letter uh, is valid, but that's when we use things such as React, for those of you who are aware of what React is. For now, and when you're writing just regular HTML, stick with the lowercase. Okay, so elements or HTML elements can be placed within other elements. And this is known as nesting. So if we wanted to state that uh, the Stackademic squad are the best, we would we could wrap the words the best in a strong element, uh, which means that the word is to have strong text formatting. Um, you'll notice here as well that um, when we open our strong tag, uh, which you can see at the beginning of the second line, uh, we then close that tag before we close the p tag and that's that's really important um, so tags have to open and close in a way that they are inside or outside one another um, rather than kind of mixing them up so to avoid issues ensure that you're always opening and closing tags in such a fashion similar to uh kind of uh input it you know opening and closing a russian doll uh, okay, so there are two important categories of elements to know in HTML. Uh, there are block level elements and inline elements. Now, block level elements form a visible block on a page. Um, a block level element appears on a new line following the content that precedes it. Inline elements typically appear inside of block elements. Another way to kind of look at this or think of this is a block level element is usually going to fill the entire width of the page, uh, whereas inline elements won't do that. They will just fill the Okay, it sounds like somebody just muted me. So as mentioned before, don't press any of the buttons. <laughs> Can you all hear me now? Okay, good. It sounds like you can hear me. So, yeah, as I said, don't press the buttons because you've ruined the experience for everyone else. And we're recording this for everybody else who cannot be with us. So we want to try and give them the best experience that we can. Um, okay, so um, where was I? Uh, we're talking about block level elements and inline elements. Um, okay, so... Block level elements are usually structural elements on the page. Uh, for example, uh, a block level element might represent things like headings or, or paragraphs or lists, uh, navigation menus or footers. Uh, in the case of, of the example you can see on the screen, we're using a paragraph. Um, block level elements wouldn't be nested inside of an inline element, but it might be inside nested inside of another block level element. In other words, block level elements can contain other block level elements and inline elements, whereas inline elements would only go inside of block level elements, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, on the screen, the strong tag we see, that is an inline element, whereas the P tag is a block level element. Uh, I could see I've actually 
incorrectly put block level element for both of them. So that's my apologies. Just to clarify, the strong tag is an inline element, not a block level element. Um, okay. So um, empty elements, as we said, do exist as well. Uh, now, not all elements follow that pattern of that opening tag, content, closing tag uh, setup. Some elements just consist of a single tag, which is typically used to insert or embed something into a document. So for example, if we had an image element, um, we would just embed the content of that uh, with these attributes. Uh, and you can see, we actually close the tag off at the end. There isn't another closing image tag. It's just that one single tag. Um, and as you can see on there, there is a, an attribute as well that elements contain uh, can have. Now, this isn't just for those um, self-closing elements. This is for all HTML elements. So uh, in, this, in this case, we, what we have here is a SRC attribute, uh, which is short for source, uh, and we use that on our image tag. So attributes typically contain extra information about an element that won't appear in the content, but can dictate the content. Um, in this example, the source attribute, uh, like we said, is, is for the source, and it gives us the link to an image. Um, and there are many different types of attribute as well used for a variety of things. Okay, so that kind of brings us up to uh, the end of the first part. Uh, now, what we are going to do is spend some time um, looking at some HTML code, but we'll also be explaining it as we go along. Um, just before we go into that, I just want to make sure, is everyone okay? Is everyone kind of understanding where we're at so far? Okay, that's good. Apart from Jimo said that um, they cannot see a thing. I'm not sure why why, why that is. Um, so uh, I don't know what to say in regard to that. It looks like everyone else is okay so far. And uh, yes, Asaiya, um, hopefully I pronounced your name right this time. Uh, yeah, they're, they're insensitive. Um, but, you know, like I said, we, we need to try and keep, uh, maintain best practices. Um, that's why I think this lesson is still important, even though I know a lot of you will, will know HTML, um, because there are there are so many practices out there that people do um, that are bad practices, and and but we pick them up because we don't know any better, and that's that's no fault in anyone. It's just kind of the way we've learned it, and then we've not and we've kind of not improved on certain things because I think when when you learn HTML. You learn enough to, to continue, and then you start to move into CSS and JavaScript and so on without going back and actually kind of mastering HTML. Um, so, um, right, let's carry on. Chantal, I'm so sorry. I don't know why it's not working for you. In that case, um, you might have to just wait until the YouTube video comes up uh, or is uploaded later today. Um, or yeah, Hafiz as indeed trying our web page. Um, okay, so let's get into part two. Uh, I just need to switch to another tab now, so um, you might see my face for a moment. Um, indeed, yes, you do see my face for a moment. Um, okay, right. Let's go to Code Pen. Okay. Right, so um, we are going to uh, look at the um, anatomy of a HTML document. So let's copy some code onto the screen. Now, first, I just want to make sure, can you all see CodePen on my screen at the moment? And you can all see it's just empty. Great, okay, that's good. Um, Okay, dokie. Right, so let's copy some initial code in. Um, just give me one second, because I've noticed I'm just missing something from this. So let's just copy that in, and then let me just grab another line and put that in there. Let's change the title to something a bit more interesting. 
So stackademic, and then let's put stackademic squad are the best. Uh, okay, cool. So um, yeah, let's let's take a moment to kind of break down what code the code we have here line by line. I'm sure some of you already understand it, but maybe you don't understand it super super well. So this first line we have here, um, where it says kind of oh, basically line one, where it says doc type. Um, now when HTML was really really young in the in the early days of of the internet really um we're talking about kind of well 30 years ago now um doc types were meant to act as links to a set of rules that a html page had uh, and it had to follow them in order to be considered good html so but doc type is essentially just this art this kind of historical artifact that um We've kind of moved past it, but we still have to include it in order to make sure everything works right. So that's why you'll see that often at the top. And this is actually the shortest HTML tag uh, in existence in regards to kind of attributes and things like that. Um, okay, and then let's just open this up a little bit. So here you can see here we've got HTML, which just wraps all the content on the page. Um, Sometimes gets referred to as the root element. Um, if you're writing a, if you're writing HTML, you pretty much should always have this doc type at the start, and you should always have HTML tags. Um, then we've got this head tag here. Um, so this element acts as a container for everything that you want to um, include on the HTML page that isn't content to show the the viewers. Um, so uh, that might sound a bit strange because if you're making something for a browser, um, why are you kind of putting all of this stuff in there? That, um, But why do you need a section that isn't actually for viewers? Well, this typically will include things like keywords and a page description, things like that. These are things that will be useful to uh, search results, search engines, I should say, and kind of social, um, social media platforms. Um, You'll also include other things in there, like uh, maybe a link to a CSS file uh, or maybe um, links to uh, fonts and things like that. Um, you'll learn more about this as we kind of continue anyway, or as we move on. Um, OK, now on line five, uh, we have something known as a meta tag. Um, and it's got this kind of car set or, or character set, really. Um, so meta set. Uh, sorry, meta <laughs> car set equals UTF dash eight. Um, this specifies the character set of your document, uh, which is in our case, or in most most instances, is going to be UTF eight. Um, UTF eight uh, basically includes most characters for the vast majority of human written languages. Um, UTF stands for Unicode Transformation Format, uh, and eight means eight bit blocks to represent a character. For anyone who knows anything about kind of like ASCII sets and things like that, um, you might have heard of these things before. Um, it's interesting, but I mean, you don't really need to know more than than this kind of meta car set. As long as you've got that in there, your browser should more or less be able to interpret the language that you're writing in. And by that, I mean, not necessarily HTML, but the, uh, the, the linguistic language, let's say. Linguistic language. Um, right, someone appears to have unmuted themselves. So let me just mute that again. Okay. Um, right, okay, cool. Uh, where was I? Um, okay, yeah, so on line seven, uh, we've got another meta tag. Um, this one's got quite a lot of information in there. Um, so this is with regards to the viewport. Um, and what that means is the, the actual kind of um, the dimensions of the screen. Um, if you think, say, you know, if you're watching this on your phone right now, the viewport is the, the dimensions of that phone screen. Um, 
Now, inside of there, you can see we've got this name, but then we've also got this second bit here, which is content. And we can see inside of content, we're actually setting two values. We've got this width value, and we've got this initial scale value. Now, um, the width property controls the size of the viewport. Um, so here, if we wanted, we could set width to something specific. Like if we wanted to make it so that um, the width of our page is 300 pixels, we could do so by putting 300. So even if, say, your uh, phone screen was 360 pixels wide, if we set it to 300, it's it's not going to go beyond that. You're going to have, you know, kind of white space on on the on the right hand side. Um, so typically, what we would do is just put device width, uh, and that just means whatever size the width of the screen is, that's what we're going to use. Um, you can also do things like that for height as well, but um, as long as you set the width one, that's that's most important. Um, and then we've got this second one here, initial scale. Now, the initial scale property controls the zoom level when the page is first loaded. Um, so if we go with 1.0, that just means kind of 100%. Um, so, you know, if, if say, you're browsing a website, um, sometimes, I think sometimes maybe people do this more so when they're browsing on a, on a laptop or a desktop, at least I do anyway, you might kind of zoom in and zoom out on pages. Um, 1.0 is just the equivalent to 100%, which is just the regular scale. If you don't set some of these things in your web page, uh, and uh, it can make the page look a little bit strange. So if you ever upload a website and notice it's not quite looking right, uh, it could very well be because you've not set a meta tag or you've set it incorrectly. Um, with this initial scale thing as well, there are other things we can do. We can also do things like maximum scale, minimum scale, uh, and so on. If we, you know, we don't want the user to be able to zoom in or zoom out too much, but they're not really as common as the ones that you can see, which is the just setting the initial scale. Um, you know, whenever you set up a web page, you should everything that you can see on the screen now, you should always have that as a minimum um, because it's it's best practice. Um, okay. Um, uh, okay, let's see what else we've got. Um, okay, yep, so we've got a title on line 10. Um, now, the title element, element sets the title of the page, uh, which it, but it's also the title that appears in the browser tab um, when the page is loaded up as well. Um, and it's also used to describe the page if it ever gets bookmarked by, uh, by a user. Um, so, for example, um, oh, you can't actually see the you can't see the uh, title tag in the actual browser that I'm sharing on the screen. Um, so, never mind. But uh, yeah, it's important anyway. If if we could see it, it will say stackademic. Um, okay, and then we are closing off our head tag, and then we move into the body section. Now, the body contains all the elements that can uh, display on a page. In including things like text, images, videos, uh, games, audio tracks, you know, whatever else. Um, this is where you're going to be spending most of your time inside of this uh, body tag. Um, okay, so um, actually, let's just put that back in. So I wanted to just take a moment to talk about white space. Um, now, you can see that I mean, already I've kind of started, you know, putting lots of space in between these things. But I could also, if I wanted to, just put lots of space there, um, you know, for whatever reason. If maybe I'm doing it just because it helps me read it better. <laughs> Obviously, that's a bad example. But you'll notice that even though I've got loads of space there, it makes no difference to what you see in the browser in that right-hand side. Um, so essentially, um, it doesn't matter how much white space you put in there, um, it's not going to make a difference because when your page gets parsed by a browser, and parse is just another way, a nice way or technical term, I guess, for saying kind of interpreted um, or processed, um, it, you know, the HTML is going to remove all of that white space anyway. Um, so you do that just to improve, improve your readability. Of course, like I said, that's a crap example. So let's just uh, let's put them back in. Um, okay. Um, oh, in fact, one other thing I should say is whilst we're talking about white space, 
if the browser removes all of the white space, why do these single white spaces still work? Why, why are they not moved out as well? Um, and it has nothing to do with the fact that it's inside of a tag. Um, when, it, when the parser does the kind of white space reduction, it reduces it down to one space. So it doesn't just remove all the space. It just remove, it reduces it down from, you know, so say if that was three there, it's going to reduce it down to one when, when it gets processed. Um, okay, so we do things like that for readability, but you know, what else can we do for readability? Uh, well, we could make comments. So if, uh, let's just copy some, or paste some text in here. So we've got this bit here that says, I'm not inside a comment. Um, but then we've got this bit that is is a comment. And you can see that even though it's like that, nothing appears on the right-hand side. Um, let me just see, uh, I can see a comment. Um, actually, I'll come back to those in a bit. Um, okay, so to make comments, as you can see, it's got this kind of, well, it's more syntax. Um, so let's just say, hi. And I know some of you will know this already, but of course we need to make sure we cover everything for everyone. So to make an opening comment, we do this opening angle bracket and then we put an exclamation mark and then two dashes or two hyphens. Um, now, one thing you'll notice is I've started this and all of a sudden, everything below it has also become commented out. That's because it doesn't know that we've finished making a comment. So it's really important that we close it uh, by doing two hyphens and then the uh, closing angle bracket on the other side of it. Um, so bear that in mind when you do start making comments. Um, okay, so let's just write a bit more HTML. So a lot of you will probably want to do things like headers and headings. So let's just paste a bunch in here. Let's get rid of some of this that we have here. Okay, so heading tags, as you may remember from the previous lesson, are uh, H tags, um, and then they, there's H1 up to H6. H1 is typically the biggest, H2 is the second biggest, and so on. Um, and some of you will know this, um, that although you know the browser interprets it in that fashion and knows that H1 tag should be bigger than a H2 and so on, we could, we could actually just use CSS to manipulate those styles. Um, you know, for those of you who know about CSS, um, we could change all sorts of things. I mean, um, you know, for this H6 tag here, don't worry if you've not done CSS before, but um, because of course we'll cover that at some point. Let's say we want to make this uh, that. Uh, then all of a sudden it becomes really big um, or two aria. So if we wanted, we could just use h1 all the time and change the styles now the thing is although we could do that that would be a really bad practice to do that um so and the, re the reason why i mention these things is because i wanted to take a moment to talk about semantics and more specifically semantic html now semantics are relied on as everywhere um, or everywhere around us i should say we're always relying on previous experience to tell us what the function of an everyday object is. Um, I hope I'm not going on too much of a kind of a, a tangent or becoming abstract here, but it's, it's important that we understand this. So, you know, when we see something, we know what its function will be. Um, if we were reading an article, for example, and the body of text was the same size, color, and thickness as the title of the article, it'd be difficult to distinguish you know, what is the title? What is the subtitle? What's the content and so on? In a similar vein, uh, we need to make sure that we're using the correct elements um, and we're giving our content the correct meaning, function uh, and appearance. Um, in this context, H a H1 element is also a semantic element, it gi uh, which gives the text it wraps around its meaning uh, of a top level heading on your page. Um, I mean, you'll see here, I put first on there just to kind of follow the rest of it. Really, when we think of H1, it's, it's what we would call a top level heading. Um, now, this is important. And when you're making a page, you should, you should only have one top level heading. Um, 
So if, say, you wanted to create something like this H6 that actually has the same size as this H1 for whatever reason, you wouldn't do this by just having two H1 tags. You just have one um, because it gives semantic value that gets interpreted or, or used by things like search engines and screen readers. You know, whenever you search for something on the on Google, for example, most of those results that come up, they pull in certain bits of information, certain bits of semantic information from your web page, such as a H1 tag. So use them um, in the right fashion and kind of where appropriate. That's, I guess, what I'm trying to explain. Now, with, uh, with this kind of emphasis on semantic elements, there are also other things that we need to talk about. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Okay, so let's get rid of those for a moment. Um, and I wanted to talk, I wanted to talk about um, making uh, co text content bold or making it italic. Um, making it strong or, or kind of trying to emphasize certain things. Now, you know, when we when it comes to the accessibility of your content, um, semantic markup should be used properly to announce style changes to all users. Um, and for the most part, you know, fortunately, a lot of people uh, won't have to kind of be too concerned about this when they are using the internet. Um, but this isn't the case for everyone. And I wanted to talk, take a moment to also introduce screen readers. Now, a screen reader is a form of assistive technology that renders text and image content um, as either speech or braille output. Um, now, screen readers are essential to people who are blind, for example, um, and are useful for people who are visually impaired or illiterate or, or maybe have a learning disability. Now, if you consider that there are millions of internet users with some form of impairment or disability um, who rely on uh, devices such as screen readers to use your website, um, use of semantic markup or semantic HTML becomes more important or, or critical, I should say. Uh, an accessibility report found that of the top 1 million web pages, uh, only about 1% of them actually met accessibility standards, which means that there are millions of people who do not get the same experience when they view a lot of these popular websites that many other people do. So it's really important that we use semantic uh, markup to, um, to, to assist with that. Uh, now, of course, we've only spoken about H tags so far. We're not really Talk, you know, we've not really mentioned much else, but there are many elements out there that we can use to um, improve this. So going back to when we were talking about kind of um, making text bold or making text uh, uh, emphasized or whatever, um, in the case of bold text, there are, well, there are kind of three ways that we could go about doing it. So we could write something like this. Uh, we could write something like this. Uh, or we could do something like this. Um, all right, and then for this one, we could do something like, uh, what is it, font style, is it? I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's that. Maybe it's font emphasis. Or maybe it's text decoration. Um, Oh, I don't remember at the moment. Either way, this is uh, one way that we can go about doing it. Um, anyway, so let's just focus on these two for the moment because these are actually the, the important ones that we're talking about. Ah, here we go, font weight. Thank you so much, guys. I was about to, I, I didn't want to go on Google because uh, I didn't want to kind of go on too much of a tangent. And I'm sure you know how it is. There are so many kind of style tags out there that sometimes you just don't remember them when you need them in, in that moment. Um, okay, so here we go. We've got three now. Um, 
And this font weight with bold here, we could have used things like strong or 500, 600, 700, and so on. Anyway, the point here is that we've got these three. Um, let me just put that uh, there as well. Anyway, I think I'm going on a little bit of a tangent now. Okay, so we've got these three here. Now, they all look the same. If you think about the actual text, uh, the thickness and things like that, and the font size, um, but we shouldn't really be using uh, some of these. So the reason why is because when we um, when we create text that uses something like strong or we want to make it bold, if we're viewing this uh, and we've not got any sort of impairment or disability or, or whatever it may be, these all look the same. But if you're using a screen reader, um, for example, when we see this bold text here, the screen reader is not going to interpret that uh, as uh, as text that should have some sort of emphasis in the way that it is said. So we're going to get rid of that one. The same also applies for this one that we've just styled. Uh, we've made it bold, but you know, if we're doing it for some sort of stylistic value, maybe that's okay. But if we wanted our user um, to understand that this is bold text for whatever reason, for example, let's say that uh, it wasn't just a sentence that said, this is bold text, but maybe it said something such as, uh, do not click the button more than once. We might need to place some emphasis on this do not. Um, whereas if we're just using P tags, or sorry, or B tags, I should say, the user is not going to hear any sort of emphasis. So we want to use things like strong tags for that. The same also applies uh, when we, if we want to italicize something. Um, so I won't go into, into in the same amount of detail as we just did, but for all intents and purposes, before we had this kind of advent of uh, semantic markup, this is how uh, you might write uh, italic text uh, with i tags, whereas we don't really, we shouldn't use them anymore. So we replaced, we, we should use em, which is short for emphasis. Um, one question that you might have, or some people might have, is if things like b tags and i tags are a bad practice, why do they still, ex uh, still exist? Well, I mean, you have to bear in mind that the internet was invented 30 years ago, and there are millions of websites that haven't been updated for years, maybe even decades, and they will still be using these old practices. Um, if we, if you know, if all of a sudden we said, okay, no, we're not, B tags and I tags are gone, um, a lot of a lot of websites could break. Uh, and that's that's why they just still exist. Um, uh, the same also applies in a lot of other areas. For for anyone who kind of you know knows a little bit about JavaScript, you'll 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 know about an ongoing debate as to whether you should use uh, var, let, or const for variables. Um, but we'll go into that another time anyway. So the point I want to just uh, kind of drill home here is that. Screen readers are not going to announce things to, to the user um, if you're using B or I. Um, if you want to if you want to emphasize something, use strong or M tags. Um, so okay, yeah, I mean hopefully that kind of explains a little bit about the benefits of that. I, I don't want to kind of spend too much more time talking about those. Um, so let's kind of move on and look at some other tags, other HTML tags, common ones, because, um, you know, I'm sure everybody loves lists, right? Um, so lists are just everywhere, um, including on the web, and they come in two flavors. Um, they come in ordered and unordered. So let's say that we've got this list of ingredients here, milk, bread, eggs, and hummus. Uh, well, we could just write them in like that, um, but that's not really going to be um, interpreted by the browser as anything but just plain text. So as we said, there are unordered lists and ordered lists. 
So if we wanted to turn this into an unordered list, we would wrap it with some tags. Um, this UL tag, which is short for unordered list. Now for the browser, this it starts to realize that this is a list, but we actually need to make each item, um, or we need to wrap each item with a tag in order for it to truly become uh, a list element. So you'll see there, all of a sudden, it's got a bullet point on it. Let's just paste some in so you don't have to watch me writing uh, mundane stuff. And then all of a sudden, that becomes a list. Uh, but let's say that we wanted to turn this into an ordered list. Well, bear in mind a couple of things. Or unordered lists are used when the list doesn't require an order. So in the case of what we have here, we just have a list of ingredients. But if we're trying to demonstrate or illustrate to the reader, the viewer, that order does matter, then we need to use ordered lists. Uh, or rather, instead of UL, we'll change it to OL. Uh, and an example of maybe something where we do require order is if we were following, in, following uh, a recipe, for example, um, where maybe we need to do things in an order. Um, so you can see here we've got, um, uh, that should say add 200 milliliters of milk into a bowl, add two eggs, put bread in toaster, and then we will just look at the hummus for 20 minutes. Um, okay, so let's try and kind of go into something, some bits that are maybe a bit more interesting. So let's look at the anatomy of a link. Um, just to clarify as well, is everyone kind of following okay at the moment? Is everything, can you still hear me okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I agree, Axe. There's no way I could just look at hummus for 20 minutes either, but um, <laughs> uh, okay, cool. It sounds like you're all okay. Um, so awesome. Uh, I will just carry on then. So, okay, the anatomy of a link. So this is where we actually start to do things that maybe are a bit more useful. Now, a basic link is created by wrapping the text uh, or other content um, inside of an A element. Um, a is basically short for anchor. Um, but we can just think of it as if we're making a link, then we need to use an A tag. Um, and then we use something called a href attribute as well, uh, which is short for hypertext reference. Um, so let's just paste some code in. So we see here we've got, um, I mean, I'm sure most of you kind of know what's going on, but um, just to clarify, um, uh, yeah, so we've got a P tag that says I'm creating a link to, and then we've got this A tag here that says my homepage. And then if I clicked on that, that should take me to my homepage. Um, so the important bit here to note is this href. So the actual content we put in it here is just the um, link to whatever it is that we're linking to. Uh, now we could spend some time talking about absolute links and relative links. Um, but I've actually got some uh, information that I'd like you to read as part of your homework. And I'll, of course, I'll give you that information at the end. Uh, one thing I also wanted to point out here is you'll see here that I've got this link um, wrapped inside of speech marks. Now, technically, we could just use uh, apostrophes if we wanted to. Um, the browser's not going to tell you off. As long as you maintain some consistency, it's fine but you should really use speech marks, in my opinion. Another thing that people might not realize is that you could actually just leave them off completely, but it can break things. You'll see in this case, it doesn't break anything, but it could. So don't risk it. There's no point. Um, just stick with putting them inside of speech marks and then you will reduce the amount of bugs that you could potentially have. Um, another thing that we could add onto this uh, is uh, an alt tag. Um, so as we have this, or an attribute, I should say, so we've got this href, we could also do something like alt, 
uh, and we could just write this is a link to my website. Now, an alt tag is also something for screen readers and accessibility. So again, it's really important that you try to factor these things in whenever you're creating a website. Don't just make a website that um, looks good to you. Take, like, take the time to actually think about how you can give the best experience to everyone that is potentially viewing your website. Um, okay, so with this kind of a, uh, uh, this link that we've got, what we could actually do is we don't have to just put text inside of there, like how we've got this my home page. We can actually put more content inside of it. So for example, uh, we could do something like this, um, where we've got our A tag, but then inside of it, we've actually just got this image tag in there. Um, and then this whole thing becomes the link. Um, sorry for anyone who all of a sudden has just seen a massive picture of my face on there. Um, uh, awesome as well that some of you guys are actually picking up uh, and kind of answering the questions as we go along. That's amazing. Um, so thank you for that. Okay, so finally, I wanted to just take some time to talk about the basic sections of a document. Um, so, a web, you know, web pages can and will look pretty different from one another, but usually they tend to share, you know, pretty standard components. So it's good to understand the overall meaning of all of the HTML sectioning elements in detail, because this is and this is something that you'll you'll work on gradually as you start to get more experience with web development. Um, so what I would like us to do is I'm just going to stop this tab and load up a another web page that um, I would like us all to kind of spend a little bit of time analyzing. Um, right, so I'm sure many of you will know this website because a lot of people end up going on it when they're beginner coders and it's W3 Schools. Uh, I'm not going to pass comment on whether I think W3 Schools is good or not um, because that's not the point here. But I would say this, if I was going to research anything to do with HTML or coding, I would probably look on MDN, uh, which is exactly the page that uh, Grinicher is mentioning in the chat, because MDN is way better. Um, anyway, so the reason why I've brought this page up, and let me just take a sip of water, is because when we're making web pages, we often need to uh, an, or need a mechanism to kind of break up our page into smaller chunks. And I'm not just talking about using things like P tags and so on, but actually kind of sectioning off parts of it. So, for example, here are some of the main definitions that you should try to understand. OK, and these are all tags. So the first HTML tag is the main tag. Now, this is, um, this is for content unique to the, a page. Now, a main tag, you'll only use once per page, and you usually put it inside of the body tag, okay? And usually this shouldn't be nested inside of any other elements. So you could think of it like um, the main portion of your website. Now, if we look at W3 schools, probably the main section of this website is, is this kind of everything inside of this middle part here. Uh, and it kind of as we scroll down, all of this in the middle is probably inside of a main tag, or at least it should be. The second um, HTML tag I want to talk about is the article tag. Uh, and this encloses a block of related content that makes sense on its own without the rest of the page. So an example might be a blog post. Uh, the content of that and everything might be an article. So we, if we had everything in this middle inside of a uh, the main tag, the article may potentially start here where we've got HTML tutorial and it might end uh, it might end somewhere around well actually yeah, I guess it could end around here. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so uh, okay, so we've got main and we've got article. 
the the next tag I wanted to talk about is section. Uh, section is similar to article, but it's more for grouping together parts of a page that constitute one single piece of functionality. Um, so, for example, it could be that everything we see here, this HTML exam, get your diploma and all of this, although it's inside the article, this itself might be a section. So you could put all of that content inside of a section. Um, okay, the, um, the next tag I want to talk about is called aside. Um, now, if we look at this, there are a couple of things that could be the aside. Um, if we scroll to here, anybody in the chat, would anybody like to take a guess as to what they think could be the aside? I'm guessing that's no, so I will just tell you. Um, okay, so the aside really is probably going to be, okay, yeah, acts exactly, the color picker section. So this this stuff we've got on the right here is probably going to sit inside of an aside uh, tag. Aside is one word, A-S-I-D-E. So this is content that's not directly related to the main content but can provide additional information that maybe is indirectly related to it. Um, in this case, I mean, I, 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 yeah, some of this is kind of related to it, so that's fair. Uh, but yes, that all of that stuff on the right would be the aside. Um, we've got three more I want to talk about. We've got a header, and that represents a group of introductory content. Um, it is, uh, if it's a child of the body, then it typically defines the global header of a web page. Um, but if it's the child of an article or section, then it defines the specific header for that section. So not to confuse this with titles and headings, okay? Um, so for example, it could be that HTML tutorial is inside of a header, uh, a header element. Um, okay, so two more, we've got nav, short for navigation. Um, if you can guess that, what we see on the right-hand side is the aside. You probably are aware that the navigation could, well, it could be two things. It could be either this stuff we see at the top or everything we've got on the left-hand side here. Uh, it could be that both of them are navs. Um, okay, let's have a look. Freddie's saying, use the inspector. I don't know if he's asking a question, but we are going to actually look. We are going to inspect this page in a moment um, and you'll see why. Um, and then finally, we've got footer. Now, if we've got a header up here, then we might have a footer, which is at the bottom of the page. In this case, I would imagine everything here, potentially even including those four links here, sit inside of a footer tag. Okay. Now, before we inspect the page, we've spoken about semantic wrappers, okay, semantic tags. Um, but there are also non-semantic wrappers or non-semantic tags that we can also use. Um, now, sometimes you'll come across a situation where you maybe you need to block off some, uh, some HTML, but it doesn't necessarily fit within any of those confines uh, of those previous kind of elements that we spoke about. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you just want to group a set of elements together for, for some reason. Um, if we need to do things like that, then HTML also provides a div tag, which is div, uh, and also a span tag. Span can be used for, say, if we um, wanted to do something to a specific part of text, like how we use the uh, strong and m tags. Uh, we could also use span, which kind of just doesn't add any kind of additional information to it. But then we've also got these div tags. Now, div tags are definitely the ones that everybody knows about. Um, and for anybody who has built a website, I can imagine that you've used a lot of div tags in your time. Um, now, div tags are they're not the worst thing in the world, but you know, like I said, when it comes to kind of doing accessibility and so on, um, we shouldn't really be using them. 
we, or, or rather we shouldn't just be picking them up to use for everything. We should only use them if, if there isn't another tag with a specific meaning that we can use. Um, so like I said before, even really popular websites don't follow these things. So let's take a look at the, uh, let's see if we can actually inspect this. So I've got the inspector open. I don't know if you can actually see it in your screen. That's really frustrating if you can't. Um, okay, that's frustrating. It's not actually sharing the inspector in the screen. Um, so we can't do that, but by all means, go ahead and try it yourself. Um, I'll give you a spoiler. H the W3 schools, even though it is trying to teach you about best practices and HTML, is not um, is not using any of the semantic HTML tags that we spoke about. It's just one big div soup, which is one way that we could refer to it. Um, oh, actually, yeah, Axe, you've said a really good idea. Wow, where would I be without you? Without you, students, kind of. <laughs> providing this information. Let's try and view the page source. Um, okay, let me, uh, you might see my face again for a moment whilst I switch to the source. Okay, here we go. Right, so let's get past all of this HTML. Um, okay, so look, I mean, you'll see here, we've got all of these links Right, and that's okay. We've got a bunch of links, but they've just been wrapped inside of a div uh, instead of maybe using a nav, for example. Um, we seem to have multiple H3 tags, a lot of them, uh, which it means it's, you know, screen readers and search engines are not necessarily going to interpret this very well. They, um, they might just pick the very first H3 tag that they see, but that might not necessarily be what you want to highlight to search engines. Um, let's keep going down. Wow, we've got loads of H3 tags um, and lots of divs where we could be using things like articles or, uh, or, or whatever else. Um, yeah, so, you know, just... <laughs> I mean, look, and we've got H1 here. Um, we've got some H2s that are appearing below H3s. It's it's one big mess. Let's just say that. I, I don't want to uh, spend too much time going into it. Um, one thing we could maybe say is that uh, W3 schools can teach you about HTML and programming, but it can't teach you about best practices. Uh, and best practices are really important. So let's just um, close this out now. Um, so I think we've kind of spoken about a lot of this stuff here. Um, so let's just summarize. Okay, so HTML is the most basic building block of the web. Uh, markup is used to annotate content for display in a web browser. Most elements contain content, but some do not. Uh, elements are case insensitive, but lowercase should be used. The head contains content that is not shown to viewers, uh, um, and whereas the body is. Uh, and HTML can contain metadata that search engines and social media platforms make use of. Uh, and use, use as much white space as you like when writing HTML. Um, the same also goes for comments. Use as much of that as you need. Um, semantic HTML is important. Always consider accessibility. Don't use B and I tags. Um, don't use div tags all the time. Consider whether there is a better option available. Uh, and there are many tags available for helping to break up HTML documents into sections. Uh, okay, so I hope you have found that useful. Um, so I'm just going to stop that bit and I guess you can see me again now. Um, so hands up if anybody found out anything new or not hands up, but leave a comment. Did anybody learn anything new today?
Uh, awesome. Oh, actually, oh, some people would like to speak. Uh, that is a, that's fantastic because we are going to do a little bit of a Q and A. Um, one thing before we answer those bits, um, before we do that, I'm just going to stop the recording and then start it again because it's going to cut off at an hour. So let me just stop the recording now.